Hi guys. Well, it was a gorgeous sunrise here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on this chilly. Where are we? Wednesday morning, January 29th, 2020 here in the uh, paradise of Inverness, Florida. And my name is Sam Mitchell and you have stumbled in to Collapse Chronicles where every day I come on here and just do what the name suggests. I, I chronicle the collapse of a civilization and a planet and we have <clears throat> hit a milestone on Collapse Chronicles today. We had our one millionth view yesterday. One million people have come, have stumbled into this uh, <laughs> weird little social experiment here on YouTube, and I really, really appreciate all the uh, all the folks stopping by and those subscribing and. The few of you supporting what I do on Collapse Chronicles, I do appreciate the support and the moral support and keep coming back. So I guess somebody, at least a million times, <clears throat> tuning in to uh, hear the news of a collapsing planet and uh, oh man, there are so there is so much doom and gloom to choose from. I am going to go with this uh, this essay. It's a couple of years ago that I found on uh, Science Magazine, I guess is just straight ahead. Science Magazine by this uh, woman I need to get on the show. Uh, Eileen Christ. And this is her essay from about a little over a year ago called Reimagining the Human. Reimagining the Human. I, <laughs> well, anybody who imagined uh, what we call humans now, good Lord. So anything we can reimagine can only be an improvement, I guess. So I'm going to put the link on this fine essay from Eileen and suggest you read it yourself, but uh, this is a long article. I will not sure I'll get to the end of it, but if you just want to sit around and listen to me read it for you, I'll be happy to do that, but you should go on the link and read it yourself. Okay, take it away, Eileen Christ, and tell us about reimagining the human. <clears throat> For those of you not aware of this, Earth is in the throes of a mass extinction event and climate change upheaval risking a planetary shift into conditions that will be extremely challenging, if not catastrophic, for complex life. Although responsibility for the present trajectory is unevenly distributed, the overarching drivers of, of the collapse of a planet are rapid increases in, number one, human population, hmm, number two, consumption of food, water, energy, and materials, and number three, infrastructure incursions into the natural world. As the trends of more, the trends of more on all of these fronts continue to swell, the ecological crisis is intensifying. Given that human expansionism is causing mass extinction of non-human life, and threatening both ecological and societal stability, why is humanity not steering toward limiting and reversing its expansionism? 
The rational response to the present day ecological emergency would be to pursue actions that will downscale the human factor and contract our presence in the realm of nature. Yet, in mainstream institutional arenas, economic, demographic, and infrastructural growth are framed as inevitable, while technological and management solutions to adverse impacts are pursued single-mindedly. Although pursuing such solutions is important, it is also clear that reducing humanity's scale and scope in the ecosphere is the surest approach to arresting the extinction crisis, moderating climate change, decreasing pollution, and providing sorely needed leeway to tackle the problems of poverty, food insecurity, and forced migration. The question that arises is why the approach of contracting the human enterprise tends to be ignored. The answer lies in the deeper cause of the ecological crisis. A pervasive worldview that imbues the trends of more with a cachet of inevitability and legitimacy. This worldview esteems the human as a distinguished entity that is superior to all other life forms and is entitled to use them and the places where they live. This belief system of superiority and entitlement of human supremacy manifest itself in a range of anthropocentric commonplace assumptions, linguistic constructs, institutional regimes, and everyday actions of individual, group, nation-state, and corporate actors. For example, the human is invested with powers of life and death over all other beings and with the prerogative to control and manage all geographical space. The all-encompassing manifestation of the belief system of human supremacy is precisely what constitutes it as a worldview. <clears throat> This worldview is not necessarily an explicitly articulated narrative. Rather, it forms the tacit postulate from which people source meaning and justification to disregard virtually any limitation or action or way of life in the ecosphere and toward non-humans. Human supremacy is the underlying big story that normalizes the trends of more and the consequent displacements and extermination of non-humans as well as of other humans who oppose that worldview. In this context, it is crucial to recognize that human supremacy is neither culturally nor individually universal, nor is it derived in any straightforward way from human nature. Well, again, this is Eileen's uh, essay, Not Mine. I just want to point out once again, that just because I offer the, the opinions and insights of others, that does not mean I 100% agree with everything they say. Okay, moving along. However, 
Western civilization has elaborated its most forceful, long-standing expression, and through the West ascendancy, the influence of this worldview has now spread across the globe. Other uh, way of saying everybody wants to be an American. <clears throat> the the now planet-wide sense of entitlement bequeathed by a human supremacist worldview blinds the human collective to the wisdom of limitations in several ways, thereby hindering efforts to address the ecological crisis by downscaling the human enterprise and withdrawing it from large portions of land and sea. First, because the worldview demotes the non-human in favor of the human, it blocks the human mind from recognizing the intrinsic existence and value of non-humans and their habitats. Non-humans are rendered as resources and considered dispensable or killable. It is assumed that natural areas can be taken over and converted at will. Second, a worldview founded on the elevation of the human impairs the experience of all for this living planet, inducing instead the perception that viewing the ecosphere as a container of natural resources, raw materials, and goods and services makes sense. If humanity inhabited Earth with a profound sense of all, news of the impending mass extinction would galvanize the world into action. Instead, what we find is that the response to anthropogenic mass extinction is muted in mainstream media and other social arenas. Third, Based on the conviction of the special distinction of the human, this worldview fosters the belief that humans are resourceful, intelligent, and resilient enough to face any challenges that may come our way. This tacit missive bolsters societal torpor and political inaction because it is widely assumed that technological innovations and interventions will overcome problems. Can you say geoengineering? Can you say the Green New Deal? <clears throat> Fourth, this worldview impedes humans from recoiling from or even seeing the violence of an expansionism that fuels extinctions, population plunges, mass mortality events, and starvations of non-humans. Because these experiences are happening to the merely living they are non-issues for mainstream media and the political sphere, which are focused almost exclusively on human affairs. For example, humanity's impact has become so pervasive that migratory animal species are in decline and the very phenomenon of migration is disappearing around the world. Yet, neither the loss of animal migrations nor the sufferings of the animals involved seem to be matters of concern in public arenas. <clears throat> Lastly, the human supremacist worldview insinuates that embracing limitations 
is unbefitting of human distinction, whether openly or implicitly, limitations are resisted as oppressive and unworthy of <clears throat> humanity's stature. By operating on all these levels, the worldview of human distinction and prerogative obstructs the capacity to question human hegemony for the sake of Earth's inherent splendor and in the service of a high-quality human life within a downsized, equitable, global civilization nested in an all-species commonwealth. Instead, the trends of more owe the population on the population, consumption, and infrastructure fronts are left to persist their course seemingly unassailable. The reigning human nature hierarchical worldview thus hinders the recognition that scaling down and pulling back is the most far-sighted path forward. Scaling down involves reducing the overall amount of food, water, energy, and materials that humanity consumes and making certain shifts in what food, energy, and materials are used. The quantitative and qualitative change can be achieved by actions that can lower the global population within a human rights framework, shrink animal agriculture, phase out fossil fuels, and transform an extractionist, overproducing, throwaway, and polluting economy into a recycling, less busy, thrifty, more ecologically benign economy. These shifts must align with a new ethos in civil society toward shared norms of mindfulness around dietary, dietary choices, avoidance of waste, conservation of energy, and reuse and recycling of materials. Scaling down can be complemented with su substantially pulling back our presence from the natural world. Achieving continental scale protection of terrestrial and marine habitats will enable sharing Earth generously with all its life forms. Recent research reveals that large-scale nature conservation is also a powerful counter to climate change by absorbing a sizable portion of the carbon dioxide of the industrial age and preventing additional carbon stored in the ecosphere from ever being released. Vastly expanding marine protected areas will support the resurgence of marine life, ambitious forest, grasslands, freshwater ecologies, and wetlands protection and restoration will prevent extinctions and preempt an anthropogenic mass extinction event. A robust global network of green and blue protected areas will save wildlife populations and animal migrations from their current downward spirals. Preserving the night sky in extensive swaths of wild nature will keep an open portal into the cosmos we inhabit. Many of the global approaches called for in this pivotal moment 
may lack the glamour of technological and engineering breakthroughs, but they promise far-reaching strides in resolving the ecological crisis and preventing human and non-human suffering. Paramount examples include state-of-the-art family planning services for all, including modern contraceptive technologies. Universal education from the age of 4 to 18. Substantial reduction of animal product consumption. Adoption of the reduce, reuse, recycle paradigm as an everyday norm massive protection of wild nature, and adoption of sustainable and ethical food production practices on land and sea. Uh, okay. Um, all right, I'm just going to go ahead and plow, plow on through this. Uh, so how do we get beyond human dominance. The dominant framework of techno-fixes, technological schemes, and fine-tuning efficiencies is by itself no match for the tidal wave of human expansionism expected in this century. Looming before us is the imminent escalation of food, energy, materials, and commodities production, and resulting increases in wildlands destruction, species extinctions, wildlife extirpations, freshwater appropriation, ocean degradation, extractionist operations, and the production of industrial pesticide, nitrogen, manure, plastic, and other waste all unfolding amid climate change ordeals. In the face of this juggernaut, a singular focus on techno-managerial portfolio seems fueled by a source other than pragmatism alone, that portfolio, which would include such initiatives as climate geoengineering, desalinization, de-extinction, and off-planet colonization, is in keeping with the social rubric of human distinction. The prevalent corpus resonates with a Promethean impulse to sustain human hegemony while avoiding the most expeditious approach to the ecological predicament, contracting humanity's scale and scope by means that will simultaneously strengthen human rights, facilitate the abolition of poverty, elevate our quality of life, counter the dangers of climate change, and preserve Earth's magnificent biodiversity. To pursue scaling down and pulling back the human factor requires us to reimagine the human in a register that no longer identifies human greatness with dominance within the ecosphere and domination over non-humans. The present historical time invites opening our imagination toward a new vision of humanity no longer obstructed by the worldview of human supremacy. Learning to inhabit Earth with care, grace, and proper measure promises material and spiritual abundance for all. 
There you go. Thank you very much, Eileen Christ. Uh, we have to get Eileen on the show and find out exactly, you know, what she is proposing. And number two, exactly how she thinks we're going to convince 8 billion humans to go along with her program. But anyway, uh, I need to uh, wrap up today's Chronicle of the Collapse to see if uh, I have a check in the mail from my rich sister to go buy a little trailer to survive the oncoming collapse of global industrial civilization inside. And uh, so if you enjoyed this essay by Eileen Christ, please take a few seconds to thumb up Eileen. If you did not appreciate what Eileen Christ had to say about reimagining the human, please take a few seconds to thumb her down. And by all means, when you're over here, please subscribe to Collapse Chronicles so we can move on towards 2 million views and get out there and enjoy it while you still can. Bye, guys.